welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello again, Walter. Good day. How are you doing? I see we're both little boys blue today. Yeah, but good um, birds of the feather flock together. So, <laughs> uh, you look a little bit tired. Have you had um, a loss of sleep in the last few days? <laughs> sleep is a luxury, let's put it that way. <laughs> No, you look fit as a fiddle. So, can you open up for us with a word of prayer? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we need you more and more. As the world ends up in turmoil, it is necessary, Lord, that we stay very close to you. And we pray that you will stay very close to us. Enlighten us with your spirit. Give us the right thoughts and right words to speak. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, a lot has happened in the recent few weeks. And I think it's time that we again get some updates on what's happening in the world. And will you guide us in this whole discussion today? Because there's a lot of articles that we're going to be discussing. Yes. And um, I think over to you. Well, not only over to me, over to you too. You're not going to get off this lightly. Get off this lightly. Well, let's have a look at some of these interesting things. Just to get uh, a link to where we were, we were discussed the COVID-19 pandemic and all of these things in the past. So let's just link it to that and see where we're heading. Yes. Because if there is an agenda and if there is a plan, something must be unfolding. Mm -hmm. It can't just be haphazard. Uh, your attention is directed towards the chaos so that you don't see the line of rational thinking behind it. But we have to look past the scenes of history and see what's going on behind the scenes exactly. of history. Exactly. Just to give us that link, uh, this is a very interesting magazine, The Economist. And in 2019, they brought out this particular one over here. And it's a very interesting one because if you know where The Economist comes from and who runs it, it's a very influential magazine and it only comes out approximately once a year. So, yeah, someone wrote about it. This is not them writing. It said, why would anyone spend time deciphering these covers? Well, this person says, because The Economist isn't just any publication. It is directly connected with the world's elite. It is, a part, it is partly owned by the Rothschild banking family in England and its editor-in-chief, John Micklewatt has attended the Bilderberg Conference several times. In short, the leadership of The Economist has inside knowledge of the elite's agenda and they do their best to promote it. That's just someone's opinion. Mm. So let's just have a look at their official explanation. They say the world in 2019 will build on three decades of publishing success. This will be the 33rd edition. I made that bold. Mm -hmm. It will look ahead to the Trump administration's prospects with a new Congress, the reality of Brexit, elections in India, Indonesia, Nigeria and across Europe, tech disruptions from AI and China. Could 2019 mark peak Silicon Valley? Space travel 50 years after the moon landing and culture 500 years after Leonardo da Vinci. Now, if we know how the occult world works, then there are a couple of interesting things in this little paragraph. Number one, the 33, the 33rd edition, mm. and the Masonic 33 degrees, of course, is always very prominent. And they also love jubilees. Yeah. Remember when we had the Reformation, the 500 years of the Reformation, everything was about Jubilee and it was the 50th year of dialogue and the this and the 50 and the 500s. Now we have a very similar thing here. Yeah. You have the 50 years after the moon landing and culture, 500 years after Leonardo da Vinci, who of course was a brilliant man, 
but he was also an esoterically inclined individual. Mm. All right, so why are there such odd things on this cover? For example, the writing is all reverse. It's mirror yes. writing, mirror image. And uh, why would that be? Well, the occult uses reverse writing. Uh, Alistair Crowley used to teach his disciples to speak backwards, walk backwards, etc. Mm. Everything was in reverse. So in esoteric thinking, when you reverse something, then the, the real meaning comes to the fore. Okay. So good becomes evil and evil becomes good, for example, if you reverse it. Jesus Christ in the Bible would become the devil and the devil would become Christ. Mm. So uh, if you take a, a, a Bible study document, like a concordance or something in the esoteric world, then you have all of these reverse features in it. So there is reverse writing on here. And uh, we're not going to discuss all of these images. As I said, people can look them up on the web, but there are one or two that are rather fascinating. Of course, there is this famous image here of Leonardo's, mm. where he is slightly modified. He has glasses on there, which probably look like 3D. Yeah. Virtual reality. Virtual reality glasses. There's a... a a tattoo of DNA on his arm. There's a cannabis <laughs> plant in his hand. Uh, there's a cell phone in his hand. There are scales in his hands. And uh, there's a symbol towards sports. There are many other things over here. Angelina Jolie is depicted over here in a Mona Lisa style. We're not going to go into yeah. those details, but there are some things that are really interesting. Obviously, uh, Donald Trump and Putin mm. are in this picture. And then you have over there facial recognition written backwards. So facial recognition is going to be an important thing. Uh, Artificial intelligence is going to be an important thing. They even have Pinocchio over there, which is, of course, was also a Masonic writer. And uh, the fact that his nose here is depicted in this <laughs> long way could be an indication of deception, lying, for example. But I don't want to discuss any of these issues. Uh, people can make their own studies. I'm interested in this little portion over here. And that's what I want to just say one or two things about. These are the writers of the apocalypse. So if we'll just enlarge them a little. This was in 2019. Mm. The first thing that, that appears is that they are in reverse order. Everything is backwards, right? Yes. So in the writers of the apocalypse, when the seals are opened, uh, the first one should be the rider on the white horse, who is the king, who has a crown on his head. Yes. And this is, in the book of Revelation, the depiction of the gospel going to the world, white righteousness of Christ, Christ going out to conquer. And then, of course, it depicts the battle mm. as it unfolds. And uh, then you have the red horse, and then you have the black horse, yes. and then you have... The pale, the pale horse, horse mm -hmm. which is death. Now here they are in reverse order. So the pale horse, death, then you have the black horse, and then you have this horse, which would depict the red horse. Now red is the color of sacrifice in the Bible, right? But here it is depicted as a Statue of Liberty, and I find it fascinating that she has something on her face. <laughs> yes. And that something is a mask. Mm. This was 2019. This was before COVID-19, right? Yes. This is in the beginning of 2019, I think, when the magazine comes out. So this is very interesting. And of course, she has this crown on her head, which is a corona. Yeah. 
It's also the sign of Mitraism. And then you have the king. So if you put it in reverse order, then instead of the king going out and bringing the gospel of righteousness to the world, and then the counter uh, actions by the devil take place and the gospel is hindered more and more, first it is the martyrdom and then it is the blackness and the darkness of the Middle Ages finally leading to virtual death, right? So in, in occult thinking, if you turn it round, who will be the conqueror in the end? If the one that was to go out to bring the pure message was to be the king and he's here depicted as dead, mm -hmm. then the conqueror would be their esoteric king, which would be Lucifer. Yes. So that's a reversal. But I thought it fascinating that this magazine brings out the United States in a, in a central role before the coming of the false messiah. Yes. In a COVID-19 mask. Very interesting. So if there is a logic behind the chaos, where is all of this heading? Well, we would have to look at legislation. Mm -hmm. We would have to look at events leading to legislation and to changes. And we would have to speculate, to a large extent, who the puppet masters are. Yes. Or is everything just chaotic and there's no meaning to anything? Yes. That's the other possibility, right? We would like to see what's the signs of the times in happening in the world and is it leading to the soon coming of Jesus? Absolutely, that is what we are supposed to do. We are to place the events of history into the prophetic picture to see where we are standing in the stream of time. Yes. All right, let us just look at this facial recognition uh, issue. It's interesting that they should put this in there. And you can see the reverse writing over there. And then they also had this picture here with the cell, cell phone, phone with a barcode with a barcode on it so what is important here is can we see the finger of Rome in all of these issues facial recognition and the technology that is available because basically this technology is about control mm -hmm. because we can see it in China right the technology is being used to control the people. They even get points whereby if they accumulate a certain number of points, they may not take part in certain activities like travel, etc. So in 2016 already, the Pope met with uh, the big tech companies yes. to discuss some of these issues. So continuing his dialogue with leaders in the world of social media and technology, Pope Francis met with Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerman. And earlier this year, the Pope met with several notable tech giants. So definitely they have their finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. In the world's mobile communications, including Eric Schmidt and Apple CEO Tim Cook, he also met with Kevin Seistrom, CEO and co-founder of Instagram, two weeks before the Vatican launched the Pope's Instagram account, Franciscus. Upon its launch, the account broke a new record for gaining over 1 million followers in 12 hours. He's a popular man. Yes. Pro Francis' Twitter account at Pontifex has also left its mark in the social media landscape with over 30 million followers spread across nine different language accounts. Twiplomacy, a study of Twitter accounts of world leaders and their retweet rates, declared the Pope by far the most influential leader on Twitter. Isn't that interesting? That's very interesting, especially when you compare um, Trump. He uses Twitter all the time. All the time. Then you must know how popular the Pope is. So it him. seems as if the beast out of the, the sea and the beast out of the earth are very clued up when it comes to the use of this technology. 
After these meetings, it's interesting that these tech giants started introducing new rules. Yes. Let's have a look at some of these. It, it describes hateful content when it comes to hate speech as any video that promotes discrimination or disparages or humiliates people on the basis of their race, ethnicity, nationality, religion. That's very interesting. So if you say something derogatory about someone's religion, that is hate speech. Mm -hmm. So would it qualify if you said that one of these religious systems is an antichrist system? I think it would. I think it would qualify. Disability, age, veteran status, sexual orientation, gender identity or other characteristics associated with systemic discrimination. So they're definitely bringing in a, a code of morality which is based on hate speech legislation. Yes. Well, if you can take in the, they, the tech giants went to the Pope. Afterwards, you got some rules in their way of dealing with videos being posted or any comments being posted on Instagram or YouTube. I mean, even the children's act, that whole children, children's act came in on YouTube. Yes. And all of these things happened and then the social media started taking off videos, especially YouTube. So they, they started censoring. Yes, they started being a censorship. And then what's interesting is recently there was a clash with Trump. Yes, they even tried to remove some of his tweets and then decided not to, etc. Yeah, so, so it's interesting also... that Trump signs an executive order to combat social media censorship. So we're having this interplay. In other words, what this does, of course, is makes the moral issue prominent. How far are we going to allow things to progress uh, in order to prevent fermentation of conflict in society? In other words, what they're really aiming for is a set of rules which will limit speech to the point that conflict can be prevented by legislation. Mm. Trump has accused Twitter of interfering in the 2020 presidential election and social media platforms generally of silencing conservative voices. He warned social media giants that his administration could strongly regulate or close them down. Now isn't that interesting? He complains that there's no free speech, but then he strongly he says he can strongly regulate and close them down as well. Absolutely. So on the one hand, he wants free speech, but then he can close you down if you don't agree with if he doesn't agree with. So what, what has say. basically happened? The issue has been made prominent. That's what mm. it's all about. Okay, how far does this go? The Pope has joined with Microsoft and IBM to create a doctrine for ethical AI, artificial intelligence. Microsoft and IBM jo joined Pope Francis in endorsing the document, according to writers. The document also said AI tools should work fairly, transparently, reliably, and with respect for human life and the environment. So who's taking the moral high ground here? Yes. The Papacy. Mm. And as soon as they start introducing legislation which favors the moral high ground of the papacy, then power is given unto the beast. There's a recognition of his authority as the moral compass of the world. And this is where it's heading. And this is an image of the beast forming before our very eyes. Nice. Pope Francis wants to see facial recognition, artificial intelligence and other powerful new technologies follow a doctrine of ethical and moral principles. Now I'm sure everybody wants that. Yes. And isn't it wonderful that there is a voice that stands up for this and that the tech giants are listening to this voice? 
So is an image to the beast forming? Is the papacy the moral compass of the world? Now the book of Revelation also tells us that humanity will be very closely regulated because if you do not accept the mark of the beast, you will not be able to perform certain functions like buying and selling, for example. How will that be regulated? Mm. Now remember that uh, da Vinci had the cell phone in the hand and it had a barcode on it. How is that being utilized in the world already? And how is that legislation being introduced? Now here's an interesting article from the Japan Times. It talks about green or red light and there's a lady and she has a cell phone in her hand and she's pointing at a board. To enter many offices, restaurants, parks or malls in China nowadays, people must show their status on an app that determines whether they are a coronavirus threat. Now this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. You could have in that app many other parameters besides coronavirus. For example, your ideology. Yes. Could that become uh, part of the app? If Rome dictates to the software giants what the morality is, I think it's pretty... So um, it's pretty possible, yeah. right? So a green light lets you in anywhere. So you want to go shopping? We're talking about buying and selling here. Yes. About being an economic entity in the world. A yellow light could send you into home confinement. The dreaded red light throws a person into a strict two-week quarantine at a hotel. Yes. You don't even get to go home. No. And this is already implemented? In already China? implemented. Many Chinese people say they are happy to cooperate for the greater good. Common good? Yes. The apps have become a necessity for travel in China to book train or plane tickets or enter many public places, though not all establishments require them, such as supermarkets. But that could change. Yes. It allows authorities to look back at someone's travel history in the previous 14 days and see if they visited areas considered high risk or were exposed to anyone with COVID-19. So in China, this is already a reality. In Switzerland, it has not yet been approved, but if approved, the Swiss app will be optional and no personal data or location information will be used, so the government says. In France, the Stop COVID app being developed would allow users who become sick to anonymously alert people they may have come across. It would not use GPS location technology. Britain is also trialing a new phone app to identify localized outbreaks. So this is becoming international. Yes. It's going to be worldwide. So there is a monitoring system that is developing. And this is precisely what scripture tells us. New rules making healthy people self-isolate could quickly become mandatory. You see, the net is closing in. The UK health minister. Hancock repeated the possibility of the system becoming mandatory in an interview this morning on Sky News saying that there are powers that we took through Parliament at the start of the crisis in the Coronavirus Act to be able to mandate this. So this is jumping the gun. They mm -hmm. have already prepared already. the legislation. So we are heading towards a totalitarian regime mm. worldwide. Worldwide. There's another one from the Washington Post. Apple and Google launch coronavirus exposure software. So technology is going to play a very major role. And seeing that there is facial recognition which can pick out a face in a massive crowd, there is no way to hide it. It brings to, to mind some of these uh, Hollywood movies. Yes where this kind of technology was sort of prefigured, enemy of the state, for example, and all of those, uh, not that we should be watching them, yeah. but they are indicators of where we are going. After all, they are Jesuit theater, right? Correct. 
So what's interesting on this one is state and federal governments can use it to create contact tracing apps that citizens can download via Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. So what we are experiencing is the rise of surveillance technology. And surveillance technology will play a central part in control of populations and who gets to do whatever is deemed appropriate by the powers that be and who is going to be excluded. Mm. Now, in any totalitarian regime, surveillance is absolutely essential. In uh, Hitler's time, you had this massive surveillance system where everybody was watching everybody else. If you go to communist systems, they had a massive surveillance system. This comes a long way already. Herod the Great was <laughs> renowned for his surveillance system. So now with this technology, it is interesting to see how they have grown. Here's a, a document which tells us that the net worth of America's 600 plus billionaires has increased by more than 400 billion during the pandemic. So while everybody is going down, yes. these people are coming up. I wonder whether these are some of the merchants of the world that in Revelation chapter 18 will decry the fall of Babylon. I think we are moving in that. You know, what's interesting is the top ones of these billionaires, most of them are also tech company owners. Yes. That's just interesting. Yes, how their net worth has grown to 75.5. And the name reads like the who's who. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, Larry Ellison. This is interesting. Now, the spirit of prophecy has something to say on these issues. We read in Manuscript 135, written in 1902, under the title Instructions to the Church, that the church is to be built on Jesus Christ, the only true foundation. Let us beware that it is not marred in the building by the introduction of worthless material that will not bear the test of trial. Those who desire to possess characters that will make them laborers together with God, worthy of receiving his commendation, must separate themselves from the enemies of God in all places stand firm for truth. Christ is concerned with the heart. Mm. He's concerned about our characters. Never does he coerce or control. He allows you freedom of choice. Any system that needs to control morality by force of legislation is displaying a bankruptcy. Mm. There will be more and still more external parade by worldly powers. We see it in the world today. Yes. Under different symbols, God presented to John the wicked character and seductive influence of those who have been distinguished for their persecution of his people. This is referring to the Roman Catholic system mm -hmm. and its persecution through the Inquisition, etc. The 18th chapter of Revelation speaks of mystic Babylon, fallen from our highest state to become a persecuting power. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus are the object of the wrath of this power. So this is exactly where all of this is leading. Yes. So what should our attitude be? Should we be involved or should we stand back and observe? We have to obey government legislation as far as it does not contravene God's law. law. John writes, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lighted by his glory. 
And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, have swallowed her doctrines, yes. her morality in other words. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. In other words, they have been adulterous. They have left the true witness, which is Christ, and followed another system. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Well, we've seen riches increase dramatically, yes. whereas the rest of humanity seems to be coming poverty struck. Yeah, that's true. And there's kings also that's mingling with this Roman uh, power? Absolutely. This terrible picture drawn by John to show how completely the powers of earth will give themselves over to evil should show those who have received the truth how dangerous it is to link up with secret societies or to join themselves in any way with those who do not keep God's commandments. I don't think there is any doubt that secret societies are at play here. If you, if you look at the interplay, the Hegelian dialectic of some of these billionaires, I mean, take uh, Donald Trump. He is super rich. And on the other hand, you have Soros, who is also super rich. And apparently they are fighting on opposite sides. Yes. Or so it seems, right? Mm. Or is it a Hegelian, Hegelian dialectic to bring us to a particular point? Let us see how far this really goes. The National Catholic Reporter tells us that France's appointment of Jesuits to lead the Vatican offices an anomaly in the church's history. And then it tells us that he has appointed members of the Society of Jesus in key positions within the church. In other words, they've taken control mm. of the church. Now, what was the aim of the Jesuits? Wasn't it to overthrow Protestantism and to bring the whole world back into subjection to the papacy? That is the aim. Yes. And since we're talking about the economy, it's interesting that uh, the three highest positions are now held within the Vatican by the Jesuits. And the latest was the Spanish Jesuit, Father Juan Guerrero Alves, who the Pope appointed in November 14 to become the prefect of the Secretariat for the Economy. So the Jesuits are in control of these issues. And the economy, of course, is part of the system of Babylon in Revelation yes. chapter 18. Now in the book Great Controversy on page 232 we read, throughout Christendom Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. Uh, is this something that is just part of a dismal history, or is this still a reality today? That is a question we need to ask ourselves. Mm. I think it's a very important question because we see Jesuits popping up everywhere now. In both sides of both the Both sides. Yes. It's in Rome. It's in the... And then you, when you see the Hegelian dialectic like you've just mentioned, they're in the White House, they're in churches, and they're shouting on either side. Absolutely. I gave a lecture many years ago which was called Revolution, Tyrants and Wars, where I showed how the Jesuits 
were instrumental in most of the fomentations in the world, mm. the cataclysms. And we are heading for a time of anarchy such as never was, mm. which is going to be akin to that which happened in the French Revolution. Yes. And uh, I mean, there are videos where these crowds were running around with guillotines, isn't there? Yes, guillotines? I think in Puerto Rico. Yes. yes. In Puerto Rico, they've got, even got a guillotine. That they're taking around. These are symbols of the French Revolution. And the whole world is going to be engulfed in a similar convulsion. And the Jesuits, if they have so much practice in history of fomenting these things, why would they not be at the forefront of everything today? And we see them there. So the Gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet danger and endure suffering, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil and poverty, to uphold the banner of truth in the face of the rack, the dungeon and the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. This is what the Jesuit exercises were for, mm. the Ignatian exercises. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the re-establishment of the papal supremacy. That, that is their aim. That's their aim. The Catholic Herald reports that uh, the papacy's plan, which they call God's plan, <laughs> is to unite all humanity. Now, uh, the Bible clearly says that God's kingdom is not of this world. And this world is in enmity to God. So if you unite all of humanity, is it going to be united on the side of God or is it going to be united on the other side? There were, of course, attempts in the past to unite humanity and to keep it united and God separated them. It's also interesting that if you study the Bible, the New Jerusalem, the different nations will enter at, at different gates. Yes. So I, I'm wondering whether this is really so. When you go to the Tower of Babel, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, that's Babylon, and they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go, two, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime, bitumen or asphalt, had they for mortar. And they said, Go, two, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The very essence of that was discontent and unbelief. God had already promised that he would not destroy the world with a flood again and they built a tower to prevent them from yes. being destroyed. The search for Christian unity is making progress, says the Pope. Yes, the previous article was stated by Pope Francis in the beginning of his papacy. This is now the 26th of May, this year. Okay. Marking the 25th anniversary of St. John Paul's encyclical on Christian unity, Pope Francis said he shares the healthy impatience of those who think more can and should be done, but he also insisted that Christians must be grateful for the progress made. Many steps have been taken in these decades to heal the wounds. Mm. Very interesting terminology. Very interesting. Of centuries and millennia, Pope Francis said. In the encyclical, St. John Paul reaffirmed the Catholic Church's irrevocable commitment to working and praying for Christian unity, highlighted how Christians of all denominations 
already are united in the experience of martyrdom, called for efforts to promote a healing of historical memories and mutual forgiveness. This is almost biblical language Correct. on the reverse side. Because this healing of the wound will lead to a setting up of the image of the beast. Yes, the terminology is amazing. So we go to the book of Revelation, it says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. So this lamb-like beast, the United States of America, the symbol of Protestantism in the world, will eventually speak like the dragon. Now, how did the dragon speak? It was a totalitarian regime. It used the state to enforce its dogmas. So here again, we will have a similar system. Church and state. Yes. And it does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This is the charisma coming down. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. So this is a deceptive religion. Yes. So Protestantism from a purely word-based religion changes into an experience-based religion and then the norm becomes the experience. And that is very dangerous because the word should be the basis of your dogmas, not the experience. Mm. That is why the world is deceived into believing that the Spirit of God is working mightily. Yes. But when the Spirit leads away from the law and the testimony, then you have a problem. So there's unity, but the unity is because of this spiritual experience Correct. and not according to unity because of what the Bible says. Correct. If you take some of the experiences within the Christian community, you have very similar experiences in non-Christian religions. Mm. So when the experience becomes the norm, then unity is possible. But Christ will be crucified again. Right in the beginning of Donald Trump's presidency, he actually met with Pope Francis. Mm. And it's interesting that the Jesuits in Britain spoke about this and the hopes for peace and dialogue. And the gifts that they exchanged were interesting. A small sculptured olive tree as a symbol of peace. But how does this peace come about? Is it order out of chaos? Mm. Now Donald Trump is such an interesting uh, individual mm. and his religious affiliations are rather fascinating. So he visits the Pope, he proclaims to be a Presbyterian, in other words, of the Calvinistic mindset. But Politico magazine gave us a little bit of an insight and said who his mentors were. And his mentor, according to them, was Norman Vincent Peale. Now, Norman Vincent Peale, of course, was a 33 degree Freemason. And I actually took a picture of a painting of his with the signature 33 degree Masonic signature underneath. And I took that picture in the 33rd Lodge, the 33 degree Lodge in Washington. And uh, that's another story. It's in, in other lectures. Yes. But let's see what Donald Trump said about him. I still remember Peel's sermons Trump told the Iowa Family Leadership Summit in July. You could listen to him all day long, and when you left the church, you were disappointed it was over. He was the greatest guy. A month later, in the same news conference at which Trump tossed out Univision anchor George Ramos, he again referred to Peel as his pastor, and he says he was one of the greatest speakers he'd ever seen. Uh, Norman Vincent Peel, of course, was also the hero of Robert Schuller, and the whole modern Christian movement in the United States. So you have a very deep Masonic connection there. Known as God's salesman, P. 
appeal merged worldliness and godliness to produce an easy to follow theology that preached self-confidence as a life philosophy. Now, this is actually an anti-Christian doctrine because we are taught in the Bible to depend upon Christ. Whereas the New Age movement and the occult world tells you that you have this divinity inside of you. You must just dig deep enough to find it and to pick yourself up by your socks. Believe this in is, yourself. Yeah, this is Roman Catholic doctrine at its very core that you are responsible for your own salvation in terms of finding this obedience within yourself. Critics called him a con man, described his church as a cult and said his simple-minded approach shut off genuine thinking or insight. But Peel's outlook promoted through his radio shows, newspaper columns and articles and through guideposts, his monthly digest of inspirational messages fit perfectly into the Trump family culture of never hesitating to bend the rules, doing whatever it took to win and never ever giving up. So the power of positive thinking, not the power of submitting to Christ. And there are many photographs which show this connection. So here's Trump at the Norman Vincent Peale 90th birthday party in 1988. So they obviously had strong connections. I find his latest stunts fascinating. Remember what prophecy says? Mm. That Protestantism would form an image to the beast. Yes. That Protestantism would give their power unto the beast. The kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. In other words, they will again acknowledge papal supremacy and lend the power of the state in order to further the aims of the papacy. And anybody who didn't go along with that would be persecuted. That's the biblical narrative, right? Yes. So you have this power on the one hand which elevates humanity and you have the power on the other hand which elevates Christ. Now which one are you going to obey? Now are there any signs that they are really working to joining Protestantism and Catholicism? in a powerful union that will again persecute God's people in the end? We've already seen in the previous articles that Rome has got its fingers in almost everything at Absolutely. this stage. All the technologies, the big tech, they want to put a doctrine in for how to regulate these things. So let's... And the kings of the world have all visited the papacy and the great conferences as to how the education will be conducted in the future will take place in Rome, right? Correct. In October. Now, here's an interesting development, and I find this one fascinating. The BBC reported George Floyd death, Trump's church visit shocks religious leaders. Here he's seen with his Bible in his hand. Last night, he held a Bible in front of St. John's Episcopal Church just across the road from the White House. Today, he'll visit the shrine of St. John Paul II, also in Washington, D.C. So here you have a Protestant and a Catholic action. The Bible is being held up. This is the standard of Protestantism. Yes. So they're saying very well. Now, the Episcopal Church, of course, is... Uh, like the Church of England, basically. And uh, they have moved very largely in a Roman Catholic liturgy direction, unlike the rest of Protestantism, which hasn't gone that far yet. But here's basically the link between Protestantism and Catholicism. And then he went to the shrine of John Paul II, now this is amazing. Mm. And here is a picture that was released by the press, but the, the ones that were on their private uh, communications were even more fascinating. 
There's the Catholic News Service. Trump visits shrine on the anniversary of St. John Paul II's visit to Poland. And Trump signed an executive order during the noon hour that the White House described as prioritizing U.S. support for religious freedom worldwide. Again, we must qualify that the papacy has declared that you only have religious freedom in that it serves the common good. Yes. And that yes. we should not forget. Now, there was a lot of opposition to what he did to these visits, and both from Protestants and, and from, from Catholics. Catholics. This one comes from their private communications. Donald Trump and the First Lady Melania knelt in prayer behind the scenes during their visit to the St. John Paul II National Shrine in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday. A behind-the-scenes photo posted on Melania Trump's Instagram showed the Trumps kneeling in prayer inside the shrine. Would a Protestant do that? Would a Protestant go and kneel in the shrine or dedicate it to a Catholic saint? Apparently we can. Apparently, yes. Is this a signal that a Protestant president is willing to bow down and bow the knee to Catholic principles? Are we seeing a closing of the gap? I, I, I think so. Uh, you have to be blind not to see you this. You have to be blind, right? Uh, definitely. So is an image to the beast beginning to form? It's so blatantly in front of our eyes. I don't understand why some people can just not see this. I don't understand it either. But we have very prominent people saying there is no image to the beast forming. Yes. And everywhere I look in the media, I see the image of the beast forming. I don't know, do I have different glasses? Is there something wrong with these? <laughs> Maybe I must clean it a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the most interesting thing that has happened in the media yes. of late. This letter, and it's from, the, from June the 6th, 2020, by Archbishop Vigano's powerful letter to President Trump. Now, we just saw in the previous ones that some of the bishops were heavily criticizing Donald Trump. And here is another one who is playing the opposite role. He yes. is praising the president. But this letter to me is almost prophetic. I agree. I think we should spend a little bit of time on yes, it. Yes, definitely. Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano warns the president that the current crisis of the coronavirus pandemic and the George Floyd riot are part of the eternal spiritual struggle between the forces of good and evil. This is a, this is a very interesting statement. Now, of course, there are many web pages that say that this George Floyd uh, incident was a false flag. Mm. There are web pages that claim that this was staged, that there were very similar events in the United States with very similar occurrences in France, for example, and that there are forces behind the scenes that are fermenting racial uh, conflict and this fits in with the chaos that they want and the anarchy to bring about mm. whatever their world order is. Now, it's not our place to say whether this is so or whether it is not so, it's just interesting to note that these things are happening. Yes. Now, another point that's very important is, as followers of Christ, what should our position be? It's a critical point that you're mentioning. Yes, what should our position be? I think it's very important. Uh, do we become involved politically on this point or that point? Or do we as ambassadors for Christ stand for righteousness and truth? That. If you are a Christian, there should be no room in your heart for discriminating against anyone on whatever basis. 
You are an ambassador for Christ and you are to bring the gospel of salvation. You are to sow the seed. What people do with the seed is their business. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. The seed must be sown to all classes. There must be no discrimination. What happens to that seed is not your business. That's God's business. But in heaven, there will be perfect harmony. And nobody will esteem or deem someone greater than someone else. So, so we should not be involved in any of these no. political issues. We have very clear directives in the spirit of prophecy that we are not to be involved. Yes. So you don't even know, are these real or are they fake news? Exactly. You don't even know. So let us just do our Christian duty and let us be kind to all people and let us preach the gospel. That is our duty. And not get sidetracked. No, don't get sidetracked. So what does he say? In recent months, we have been witnessing the formation of two opposing sides that I would call biblical. The children of light and the children of darkness. In an apparent inexplicable way, the good are held hostage by the wicked and by those who help them either out of self-interest or fearfulness. These two sides, which have a biblical nature, follow the clear separation between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. Now, so far I can go along with this. I can concur, right? Yes. On the one hand, there are those who, although they have a thousand defects and weaknesses, are motivated by the desire to do good, to be honest, to raise a family, to engage in work, to give prosperity to their homeland, to help the needy in an obedience to the law of God. That's interesting. Which law? Yes. The one in the Bible or the one in the papal books? Well, he's a papal bishop, yep. so obviously he's referring to the Roman Catholic version and not the biblical version. To merit the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, there are those who serve themselves, who do not hold any moral principles, who want to demolish the family and the nation, exploit workers to make themselves unduly wealthy, foment internal divisions and wars, and accumulate power and money. For them, the fallacious illusion of temporal well-being will one day, if they do not repent, yield to the terrible fate that awaits them far from God, in eternal damnation. In society, Mr. President, these two opposing realities coexist as eternal enemies. Do you agree with that? Yes. Well, there are eternal enemies up till now, but there will come an end. Exactly. It's not a yin-yang mm, system. Mm, it's uh, there will come an end to this animosity, and God will clean up the mess. Just as God and Satan are eternal enemies, and it appears that the children of darkness, whom we may easily identify with the deep state, so now he's talking Donald Trump language, yes. which you wisely oppose and which is fiercely waging war against you in these days, have decided to show their cards, so to speak, by now revealing their plans. They seem to be so certain of already having everything under control that they have laid aside that circumspection that until now had at least partially concealed their true intentions. The investigations already underway will reveal the true responsibility of those who managed the COVID emergency, not only in the area of healthcare, but also in politics, the economy and the media. We will probably find that in this colossal operation of social engineering, there are people who have decided the fate of humanity, arrogating to themselves the right to act against the will of citizens and their representatives in the government of nations. This is interesting, because as we have seen, many of those are actually Jesuit-trained individuals. Yes. 
And we will also discover that the riots in these days were provoked by those seeing that the virus is inevitably fading and that the social alarm of the pandemic is waning. Necessarily it had to provoke civil disturbances because they would be followed by repression, which, although legitimate, could be condemned as an unjustified aggression against the population. I wonder who he's referring to. Is he referring to Soros, for example? And uh, is he running with this narrative of the deep state? Mm -hmm. So he's playing the trumpet on the side of Donald Trump. This is very interesting. It sounds like you might be reading up or be part of the QAnons. Absolutely. The same thing. Another point, of course, is the world out there says there's no conspiracy. But here is this archbishop speaking conspiratorial language in the plainest way. Yes. Amazing. The same thing is also happening in Europe in perfect synchrony. You know, things don't happen by chance. Exactly. All of a sudden, everywhere around the world at the same time. Exactly. Wow. It is quite clear that the use of street protests is instrumental to the purpose of those who would like to see someone elected in the upcoming presidential elections who embodies the goals of the deep state and who expresses those goals faithfully and with conviction. It will not be surprising if in a few months we learn once again that hidden behind these acts of vandalism and violence there are those who hope to profit from the dissolution of the social order so as to build a world without freedom. Salve et coagula, as the Masonic address teaches. Although it may seem disconcerting, the opposing alignments I've described are also found in religious circles. It is not surprising that these mercenaries are allies of the children of darkness and hate the children of light. Just as there is a deep state, there is also a deep church. And we've spoken about that. Mm. We have this notion that you have the liberal side and then you have the conservative side, even in Catholicism. In Catholicism, yes. Yes, and there are web pages that speak about this kind of thing. So the deep church that betrays its duties and forswears its proper commitments before God, thus the invisible enemy whom good rulers fight against in public affairs is also fought against by the good shepherds in the ecclesiastical sphere. So he counts himself, I think, as a good shepherd. Yes. And the good shepherd within Catholicism is against the deep state. And Donald Trump has made it pretty clear who he thinks the deep state is, right? Correct. For the first time, the United States has in you a president who courageously defends the right to life, who is not ashamed to denounce the persecution of Christians throughout the world, who speaks of Jesus Christ and the right of citizens to freedom of worship. I believe that the attack to which you were subjected after your visit to the National Shrine of St. John Paul II is part of the orchestrated media narrative which seeks not to fight racism and bring social order, but to aggravate dispositions, not to bring justice but to legitimize violence and crime, not to serve the truth, but to favor one political faction. They are subservient to the deep state, to globalism, to aligned thought, to the new world order, which they invoke ever more frequently in the name of universal brotherhood, which has nothing Christian about it, but which evokes the Masonic ideals of those who want to dominate the world by driving God out of the courts, out of the schools, out of the families, and perhaps even out of the churches. So well, here you have... This is fascinating because I can't believe it's a, actually a Roman archbishop that wrote this. No, it, it, <laughs> it's Hegelian dialectic at its best. So you have these two opposing sides and uh, everybody is waiting for this champion. 
And when this champion comes and saves Christianity, then they'll be jumping from the frying pan into the fire because they will accept this law of God, this Roman Catholic mm. version of the law of God. They will accept this morality and at the same time, they will accept everything that goes along with it, including the surveillance. And both sides would become equally oppressive. So as we said, there's this morality and the law of God is being mentioned. And this law of God, of course, contains the fourth commandment, which says, Remember the Sabbath day, and that the seventh day is the Sabbath, but the papal Sabbath is the Sunday. So by making a choice to honor the papal Sunday, I am accepting the authority of the papal system over the word of God. So where's this heading? Jubilee for the earth, looking to Laudato Si week. This comes from the Independent Catholic News. And it's from May 10th, yes. 2020. On the care for our common home. We've been through this so many yes. times. But it's interesting that they want a jubilee for the earth. And it's the theme of autumn season of creation. And a creation Sunday in September will be introduced. It's interesting. Yes. Subtly. Yeah. Just yeah. bring it in. Sneak it in there. Jubilee for the earth is a timely theme for the season of creation. 1 September to 4 October, Bishop Mark Stenger of Troyes, co-president of Pax Christi, said last month, Laudata Si is a monumental gift which could become more and more our charter in the post-coronavirus era. More and, and more. more. Let's sneak it in with one Sunday and then a weekly Sunday. The Lutheran World Federation. So now we're talking about the Protestants, Protestants, right? How do they feel about this? Season of Creation 2020 Celebration Guide. The 2020 theme, Jubilee of the Earth, it's the exact same language. Exactly the same. So have we merged the two? When Protestantism reaches across the Gulf, to take the hand of Rome, then the image of the beast will be formed. Mm. This particular year, so what are they going to do in this particular year? They're going to look at the relationship between rest for the earth and ecological, economic, social and political ways of living. That's an integration of church and state. Definitely. This particular year, the need for just and sustainable systems has been revealed by the far-reaching effects of the global COVID-19 pandemic. This is fascinating. So here's their document that they produced, Jubilee for the Earth. And there are certain interesting points in that document. Yes, this document they sent around to the churches of the world uh -huh. in how they can join in celebrating this Jubilee for the Earth. Okay, so let's have a look at it. It's also, when you look at all of these affiliated associations, then uh, it's quite quite a comprehensive movement, right? Yes. You have There's the Act Alliance, names. you have the Anglican Communion Environmental Network, you have ROCA, you have the Global Catholic Climate Movement, you have the World Council of Churches, and of course the Lutheran World Federation and the World Communion of Reformed Churches. So they're all in there. So let's have a look at some of these points. So according to this wisdom, the law of Moses included provisions for the Sabbath. Very prominent in their documents. Yes. On the seventh day of each week, God's people were free from the need to produce or consume. So they're using Jubilee language here. The rest was extended to animals and the land itself, honoring the Creator. The Jubilee was 49 years. On the 50th year, there was a release of all slaves. Yes. 
by allowing creation to rest. Following the seventh, seventh year, God's people were to dedicate a year to this ecological, social and economic restorative justice, a jubilee for the earth. Interesting. Yeah, they're linking the... Of course, the Sabbath was the seventh day, not the first day, right? Mm. In this celebration guide for the season of creation, we offer resources in the ecumenical spirit of our common vocation to protect the earth and sustain the condition for life to thrive. We encourage the entire Christian family to join us in this special time to pray, reflect, take bold action to realize a jubilee for the earth. The United Nations is also involved. Mm -hmm. COP26 is particularly significant as parties are due to announce how they will implement the Paris Climate Agreement and whether they will for short uh, participate in civil action to put pressure on governments. Yes, a church is calling for civil action. There's quite a few actions in this report and this is one of the more interesting ones. So they, like you just said... Did Jesus ever <coughs> ask for civil actions? I don't think so. Should his followers follow in his footsteps or should they? <laughs> well, we'll leave that to the, to the listener. In your wisdom, you granted a Sabbath, a blessed time to rest in gratitude for all that you have given. This issue comes up again and again. Time and again. But why is it that they cannot see that they have the wrong Sabbath? That they have a papal Sabbath? that is based on purely Roman power. They change the law and they claim it is proof of their ecclesiastical power. And yet they will use the scripture? That is astounding. We have not allowed the land to observe her Sabbath and the earth is struggling to be renewed. During this season of creation, we ask you to grant us courage to observe a Sabbath for our planet. It's clear where they are heading with this. It is absolutely crystal clear. Opening sentences. One, we gather in the image of the Creator. Many, who is a community of love. One, we gather in the name of the Redeemer, many, who reconciles all of creation. One, we gather in the presence of the life giver, many, who inspires new life and renews it. Yeah, this is some examples that they provide for how you can do it in your church. In other words, responsive reading. reading. It's a kind of Lectio Divina, where you basically follow blindly. I, I, I'm not a friend of, of these Lectio Divina where the modus operandi of the repetitions brings about a certain state of mind. Yeah. I prefer knowing what does the Word of God say and what does it mean. Yes. In your wisdom you gave a Sabbath for the land to rest, but these days our living pushes the planet beyond its limit. Yes, as you go through this document, this keeps on coming up, the Sabbath. The Sabbath. So is there a movement to bring about a Sabbath? I think definitely. Why do some people not see it? It is amazing. We pray in thanksgiving for Mother Earth, in whom all life is rooted. Did you know that life is rooted in Jesus Christ? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the life. All life is rooted in our Creator and through Him and by Him were all things created. And there is nothing that exists that was not created by Him. Mm. There is no way that I will ever bow down to Mother Earth. That is idolatry, that is pantheism of yep. the highest order. Yep. There is no way that a Protestant should ever produce a sentence like this in any of their documents. This is purely papal language. This, this is the same language as we found in Laudato Si. Yes. Pantheism at its core. Brother son, is, is there anything we can say to that? I am lost for words. I am absolutely stunned. 
whose energy radiates life. Sister water. Now I'm even more lost for words. <laughs> who nurtures and revives us and co-creatures with whom we live and for whom we are called to till and keep this garden. Could you do a responsive prayer to that? Could you say, enlighten our hearts and remain with your world? You could also organize a pilgrimage in a significant ecological site or praying with ecological themed scripture or prayers like this ecological rosary while walking. So we're back to repetitive rosary prayers. I mean, when I was in Catholicism, you had to, every time you went and did penance after you had confessed your sins, you would have to read the rosary, for example, Ten Hail Marys, One Our Father, Ten Hail Marys, One Our Father. It's repetitive prayer. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, do not be like the pagans that repeat over and over, and they think they will be heard by their repetitive prayers. That this should come from the pen of Protestants is unbelievable. Through questions you are invited to reflect on God's presence and the goodness of that which you behold. This is already sounding like Loyola's exercises. Absolutely. Reflect. These are Ignatian exercises. During this season of creation, consider contemplating all of there these words, contemplating prayers, a part of your local ecology. This is an exercise that you can choose to do alone or with a group. Invite holy wisdom to open the eyes of your heart. Who is holy wisdom here? Is it brother son perhaps? Mm. Become aware of God's presence. This is Ignatian That's it. spirituality. Reflect on the ecological cycles. This is Ignatian spirituality. Pay attention to what you feel. Yep. This is Ignatian Spirituality. spirituality. Spiritual These are formation. the exercises of Loyola. This is, to put it bluntly, demonic. Yes. A few years ago, I gave some lectures on this issue. They were called the Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation. Counter Perhaps you can put those links into this. I'll definitely do. There's two lectures, actually. It's two lectures, yes. yes. Part one and two. What's really interesting is that the document continues with this statement. Join a mobilization. Young people and their supporters from all generations are coming together for global strikes in the movement known as Fridays for the Future. Visit Fridays for the Future or Laudato Si generation the movement of young Catholics for more information on the strikes. It's unbelievable to me that a Protestant organization can call for strikes. You can urge action on climate change to protect biodiversity and promote jubilee for your local ecology by holding a strike in your community or joining a strike that is already planned. This is referring to those Greta Thunberg strikes that we made two videos on. Sunday is coming part one and two. I'll put the links of that also into the descriptions and the comments below. Excellent. You do that. It continues. The season of creation is the time of year when the world's 2.2 billion Christians are invited to pray and care for creation. What was the memorial to creation? The Sabbath is the memorial for creation, to honor the creator of the earth and all living things. And this is the opposite. As an ecumenical network, we are inspired by the urgent call from Pope Francis Laudato Si for a new dialogue on how we are shaping the future of our planet. Isn't it interesting that a Protestant organization is dictated to by a Roman Catholic morality. Absolutely. And they close off here with the members of the Season of Creation Advisory Committee and we'll see that there are very important institutions. Laudato Si Research Institute, for example, Church of England Environmental Working Group, World Communion of Reformed Churches, Greek Orthodox, 
Church of Zimbabwe, Angola, and a whole lot of others are in different um, denominations. All walks of life. All walks. Here is another uh, quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, a letter 232 from 1899. In the 17th of Revelation is foretold the destruction of all the churches who corrupt themselves by idolatrous devotion to the service of the papacy. Those who have drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. In other words, incorporated her false thinking, her false ideology, her Ignatian spirituality into their system. Everything we've just seen in the previous document. Correct. John writes, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. We've seen that. Mm -hmm. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication, constant indoctrination. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman, that is a church, sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Mm. The Roman Catholic Church is the only church in the world that uses the symbol of the woman with the golden cup in her hand. If you walk into the Vatican and you turn right and you go into the first big chamber, there she stands, the woman with a cup in her hand. She is quite blatant about it. Thus is represented the papal power, which with all deceivableness of unrighteousness by outside attraction and gorgeous display deceives all nations, promising them as Satan, our first parents, all good to those who receive its mark and all harm to those who oppose its fallacies. The power which has the deepest inward corruption will make the greatest display and will clothe itself with the most elaborate signs of power. We've seen this. Yeah, over and over. The Bible plainly declare, declares that this covers a corrupt and deceiving wickedness. Upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. What is it that gives its kingdom to this power? Protestantism, a power which while professing to have the temper and spirit of a lamb and to be allied to heaven speaks with the voice of a dragon, it is moved by a power from beneath. We are living in those times. Exactly. Review and Herald, December 13. The man of sin who thought to change times and laws has exalted himself above God by presenting a spurious Sabbath to the world. The Christian world has accepted the child of the papacy and cradled and nourished it, thus defying God by removing his memorial and setting up a rival Sabbath. After the truth has been proclaimed as a witness to all nations, every conceivable power of evil will be set in operation and minds will be confused by the many voices crying, Lo, here is Christ, lo, he is there. This is the truth, I have the message from God, he has sent me with great light. Then there will be a removing of the landmarks and an attempt to tear down the pillars of our faith. A more decided effort will be made to exalt the false Sabbath, and to cast contempt upon God himself by supplanting the day he has blessed and sanctified, this false Sabbath is enforced by an oppressive law. I believe we are heading that way. Me too. I find it astounding that they quote the Bible in the seventh day and then translocate it to the first day of the week. Yes. And nobody sees it. They don't, and they don't blink an eye. No. So basically, when we look at the developments over the last month, 
we can see a steady progress in surveillance technology, the building up of this power, the separating of the so-called dark side and the light side, and the children of the light will be those that run with papal morality mm. in all its glory. And the children of darkness will be the deep state, those that want to tear down moral values, those that are against uh, religious norms and standards, and I believe those that want to have different standards to the majority, to the common good. Mm. And we are experiencing an interesting time. And I believe we are in the final events of this Earth's history. Clearly we've seen that the papal agenda is infiltrated in all that is happening. Absolutely, and in the churches and in the state. And it's being accepted by the churches. The whole um, Protestant world embraces this whole thing. We are definitely walking into very serious times. I believe that is the case. And uh, I think we should, in our next discussion, because from what we've just read, this is not going to just stay out there. It's going to come into our very ranks. Yes. I think we should talk about the issue of the shaking. Yes, definitely. Because we've read quite a number of quotes here, and they are aligned absolutely with the Bible. This is what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 14 right up to chapter 17. This is the end time scenario. And if we believe that revelation is being fulfilled before our very eyes, then it is absolutely essential that we become serious about what we believe mm -hmm. and what we preach to the outside world. So may God give us the grace yes. to know where we stand in the stream of time and not become ostriches, put our heads into the sand and not note the signs of the times. Yes, thank you very much. And I just want to also reiterate what you said earlier. It's also imperative for us not to get involved in these things. Yes, we are observers. We are observers. We are observers. Because God's people can be on both sides of those divides. Out yes. There. So we must stand back and get the people. And get the message out. Yeah, and get them out of there. To every nation, to everybody out there, so that people can make an informed choice and say, whoa, are we in harmony with the scriptures or are we in harmony with another system here? This is not choosing sides. This is broadcasting the final message of warning to the world. Amen. Let's pray. Will you pray for I us? I will pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are very grateful that we can be living in these times and that we can have your support. Will you please bless us and keep us in these serious times that are ahead? In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.